In a world where trust is the foundation, I found mine crumbling. Is this what we've become? Echoed in my head, a line drawn from the darkest day of my life. Married to a beacon in the PR world, I thought we were invincible, surrounded by the glamour of our successes. Yet beneath the veneer of our luxury resort getaway lay a secret set to detonate. My cheating wife taught me the harshest truths about love and vengeance. As I pieced together the fragments of my dignity, I vowed to uncover the truth, no matter the cost. This is my story. Enjoy watching it. The wind howled as I huddled behind the trees on the side of the house. I said, I hate the cold. But all I could do was bear it. Regardless of the weather, I had to complete this task. Although the home security system appeared flawless, my years of construction experience had equipped me with knowledge about their construction and techniques for hacking without triggering an alert. It only took me a few minutes of work. I opened the window, threw out my tools, and brought out the machine pistol I had purchased at a Reno gun expo. I took a deep breath. The time has come. Andy, have a look at this, my wife explained, handing me a beautiful pamphlet. I noticed it was advertising for paradise, so a new luxury resort was due to open in two weeks on the Gulf Coast. And what? I asked. So what? She unfolded the brochure to see an invitation for the upcoming weekend. I noted with skepticism that it appears to be fairly pricey. Rest assured, she added with a giggle. Once the property opens, it will be quite pricey. However, this invitation serves as a pre-opening, akin to a test cruise, to resolve any issues before paying clients arrive. Our agency is advertising the resort, therefore I receive the invitation. It will benefit us and be free of charge. Felicia's final comments prevented me from disagreeing, despite my football team's scheduled game that Saturday. After eight years of marriage, we hit a hard point. Nothing serious, but somewhat annoying. And we were both aware of this. My construction company, of course, was a contributing factor, as it had been battling to survive since the Great Recession began. We experienced some difficult times. We even had to sell our home and relocate to a modest condominium to lower our monthly expenses. Nonetheless, we survived. And now business is picking up, making all of the effort worthwhile. Thank goodness Felicia has a job. She was the vice president of Orlando's largest public relations business and her ability to bridge the gap between the Anglo and Latino communities propelled her to prominence. Her face and body exemplified the best of Cuban traits. I'm Cuban too, but I'll confess that Felicia looks far better than me. If anything, her funds kept us afloat during the severe recession. However, her success necessitated an increasing number of late nights, and long hours became the norm. All of this caused us to lose some of the zest that had fueled our marriage. We used to spend entire weekends in bed together. Recently, it has been beneficial to find the strength for rapid sex in the evenings. We agreed on the importance of change and even discussed how to spice up our own lives. But we have not done anything yet. So when Felicia suggested we spend a long weekend together at this new resort, I realized that this could be just what we needed to revitalize our marriage. It's good that she recommended it. Aside from that, there wasn't anything important in the workplace and my football teammates could go without their midfielder for one game. We accepted the invitation and packed our things on Wednesday evening. It was a tremendous treat to see Felicia in her tight-ass bikini and sexier lingerie. I thought she was really going out of her way. On Thursday, we left work early. We drove west till we reached the PC Learning Center, then north through Florida via Crystal River, until we spotted the resort turnoff signs. Damn it, I exclaimed. This location is in the middle of nowhere. Why did they have to build a resort here? That's the answer, Felicia stated. Developers feel Gainesville has a potentially lucrative yet unexplored market. They seek to recruit wealthy University of Florida graduates to their home football games. It's difficult to find a place to stay near college. Why not visit a gorgeous beach resort within an hour's bus ride from the stadium? The resort has no competitors. To find something comparable, you must travel all the way to Clearwater. I winked at her. I smiled and replied, You are a very good public relations woman. When I want to, I can be really persuasive. Once we arrived at the resort, I was impressed. In addition to a number of beach bungalows with all amenities, the resort also had a high-rise hotel. Our room was on the ninth story, 
and I was thrilled that Felicia was able to get an ocean view room. We unloaded our belongings. I then called the front desk. By the time we had changed into our swimsuits and were seated on the porch, a smiling young man had served us two mojitos while we basked in the evening sun and watched the waves sweep in. I sat back and took a big sip from my drink. That was an excellent concept, Corazon. How much would all of this cost if we paid for it? I asked. Let's just say you'll need to construct a lot more structures before we can afford to remain here at full price, she replied with a grin. By the time we completed our second mojito and were thoroughly comfortable, I looked from the beach to my wife's bikini and began to brainstorm ideas. However, as I moved my chair closer to her and began stroking her neck, she pretended irritation and motioned me away. Hold on to Gray, she replied, smiling. It's time for us to prepare for dinner. There are two restaurants at the resort, and I want to check if they are as good as the owners claim. Then she ran her fingers across my chest. However, if you remain in shape after dinner, before I could grasp her, she jumped back into the shower stall, which was spacious enough for two people. Maybe we'll try it this weekend. I think this was a great start. After my shower, I dressed for dinner. I sat in front of the large flat screen TV watching Mexican football while she applied her makeup and dressed. So, do you agree? She wore a white silk dress that flowed over her body like water, emphasizing her curves. The jet black hair was cut quite short and groomed in a purely feminine manner. An obsidian necklace dangled around her neck, and her four-inch heels allowed her to stand one inch taller than me. Magnifica. This was all I could say. We chose the American Grill for our first supper, and it did not disappoint. For dessert, we shared a slice of cheesecake. Felicia commented, I think this place goes really well with the grills we had in Miami. I could not agree with her more. After finishing, we walked hand in hand to the hotel nightclub, where a Latin American orchestra was performing salsa. Felicia was a better dancer than me, but I enjoyed just following her and watching her serpentine motions. I didn't understand how someone could dance in four-inch heels. However, Felicia's dance was both beautiful and seductive. I couldn't help but feel pleased with the appreciative looks from both men and women. I hauled her off the dance floor and pretended to be exhausted. If we don't stop now, I won't have enough strength to keep you in the room, I told her. She swiftly took my hand and brought me to the door. No, she said. I've got huge intentions for today. We kissed and hugged as we rode up the elevator. But when we entered the room, she stopped me. There are no lights, she commanded, just the moon above the seas. I turned around. She stood in the center of the room facing me. She flashed me a sexy look before extending her hand and doing something with her fingers. Suddenly, the white silk garment slipped down her body and spilled to her feet. The garment revealed a thin bra and a small thong fashioned from the same white lace. She slipped out of her dress, still wearing her heels, and approached me like a model on the runway. We made love. The next morning, I went for a run on the beach, and after showering, Felicia and I walked down for breakfast. That same day, we toured the estate, and what I saw left an effect. I was still unsure about the financial viability of this business, but there was no doubt that the management planned to provide their guests with a first-class holiday. Later, Felicia had a massage at the spa while I swam in the pool. She came back exhausted, so we both napped after lunch. It was late when we awoke and by the time Felicia got on her little black dress, the Continental Restaurant was packed. We had just accepted the idea of returning to the American Grill. When a man sat with a woman at the adjacent table, she waved at us. He got up and walked over. I couldn't help but notice that you hadn't found the location. I'm Don Cavendish, and this is Mia, my wife. If you don't mind having lunch with strangers, we'd love to have you join us. I shook his hand after asking Felicia a question and receiving an encouraging nod. Don, my name is Andy Salazar, and this is my wife, Felicia. We will gladly accept your kind invitation. As I approached the table, I stared at them. They were certainly a lovely couple. He was an Englishman. Felicia is about my height and a few years younger than me. And while I wasn't a trophy wife, she was certainly gorgeous. Her outfit had an unusual neckline that drew all attention to her stunning breasts. To be honest, she was beautifully built and proud of it. We began conversing about ourselves and the resort. Don and I had just returned from Ocoli, so we were able to tell them a little about our findings. Following that, the talk veered off into a wide range of topics, 
and by the time the tiramisu arrived, I was startled to see how quickly supper had passed. After dinner, Don insisted on treating us to a cordial, and as we passed the glasses around, he made a toast to meeting new people in unexpected places. We all joined him passionately after we finished. Don was not prepared for the evening to end. I heard there's a wonderful tiny nightclub here. What if we dance a few times? I looked at Felicia and she smiled at me. Sounds good, I said. So we went. The nightclub was full when we arrived, but I must have slipped something to someone because a table emerged for the four of us. After we had ordered our beverages, Don got up and bowed to me. Would you mind if I asked your lovely wife to dance? He asked. I said, only if you let me do the same with yours. Mia gave me an encouraging glance. The band was playing classic rock tonight, and all four of them began bouncing and moving to the beat. After the first dance, we switched partners and danced two more times before returning to our table to finish our drinks. I leaned toward Felicia. Are you prepared to leave yet? I asked. As far as I can remember, we had unfinished business in our room. She nodded. We apologized and prepared to depart. Don and I shared a manly hug. He then hugged Felicia and I did the same for Mia. It seems to me that she hugged a little tighter than basic friendliness demanded, but I didn't mind. Then as we left, Don spoke again. Could you please join us tomorrow at 11 a.m.? We are staying in one of the beach villas and we'll eat on the patio. How about this? I turned to Felicia. She muttered, I really like Don and Mia. And I'd want to look at one of those beach cottages. If you are confident that we are not imposing ourselves on you, I replied that we'd be pleased to come. We went to the elevator. What a nice surprise, Felicia exclaimed. We were sitting with complete strangers one minute and dancing with old friends the next. I felt the same way. I informed her, then opened the door with my key. What are your thoughts regarding Mia? I thought she was quite pleasant, Felicia said, beginning to undress. However, I did not have the opportunity to speak with her in detail. Then she turned to give me a mischievous smile. But I understand exactly how you thought of her. You couldn't take your gaze off her breasts. I tried to refute it, but Felicia refused to listen. So I think it's time for you to pay attention to this duo. Mine may not be as big as Mia's, but I believe they will respond quite sweetly if you kiss them. It was an ideal excuse to take my wife into my arms and lay her down on the large bed. Neither food nor dancing stopped us from making very nice love. It was late morning when we arrived at Don and Mia's cottage. The brunch they made was simply amazing. Lunch on the spacious screened-in porch at the back of their cottage was delightful, especially with the ceiling fans providing a cooling breeze. By this point, we were all pretty comfortable with one another. I wasn't shocked when Felicia and Mia wanted to sunbathe next to the infinity pool. Don had a different idea and encouraged me to accompany him on their deep-sea fishing yacht. Even though I've lived in Florida my entire life, I've done very little deep-sea fishing, so I couldn't wait to go with him. We arrived at the pier, where he had docked his 38-foot cruiser, the Chris Craft. Don took a chest full of beer and ice and asked me to grab a few cans of gas. When you're in the ocean, you don't have enough beer or gas, he remarked, laughing. When we got a few miles into the bay, Don pulled out our rods and baited our lines. Beer and attention made for a good day. Don was an intriguing character, and if the home and yacht weren't enough, his stories quickly revealed that he and Mia were pretty wealthy. Suddenly, my rod bent double, and the line whistled off the reel. Do you have anything? Don yelled and helped me grab the fishing rod. He then took the wheel and started guiding the cruiser to help me drag the rod towards him. I thought I was in decent physical shape, but it took all of my effort just to stay in the boat. Don suddenly exclaimed, Here she is! and I saw a blue and white torpedo emerge from the water. What is this? I shouted. Don walked up and whacked my back. If I am not mistaken, Andy, you captured a Mako shark. The fish jumped a few more times in an attempt to free itself, but I gradually drew it up to the boat. As she approached, I was astounded by how large she was. I turned to face Don. Are we really going to try to throw him away? I asked. But before Don could respond, the shark bit the rope and swam away. Don attempted to console me after I lost my shark, but to be honest, I was relieved I didn't have to confront that beast. I was fatigued and ready to return to shore. When I returned to our room, I was eager to tell Felicia about my exciting adventure, and she listened with delight. But I realized she was thinking about something. And after I finished my Who Got story, she jumped at the chance. I also had a little adventure today, she remarked with an expression I didn't recognize. 
Mia and I had a really intriguing talk by the pool. She stated that she and Don enjoy switching things up from time to time. I do not comprehend. I expressed my confusion. What would they like to change? Felicia treated me like a naive child. No, Andy, they enjoy changing partners for sex. I responded as soon as I understood. Wow, I would never have imagined that. But that wasn't all, Felicia said with a small smile. Mia asked if we wanted to switch with them today. I sat down abruptly on the bed. It was too much to start with. We just met them, and now they want us to have sex. Mia was obviously appealing, but I figured this was the time for Felicia and me to reconcile. I do not know, honey. I mean, I genuinely enjoy them, but it's sort of surprising. What are your thoughts? It was Felicia's turn to sit next to me. I believe we can do this. We've been talking about trying something like this for a long time, and now is the best time to do it. We do not know these people well, and we reside in different cities. We will not deal with them on a regular basis. Furthermore, you have to admit that Mia was really attractive when she stated this. I couldn't help but think about how Mia looked in a bikini before we went fishing. The prospect of being with a fresh woman after so many years suddenly appealed to me. However, I wanted to be certain of Felicia's feelings. Corazon, are you certain? We had a lovely weekend together, and I would be delighted to devote all of my time and attention to you. I responded, holding her hands in mine. Let us do this. She spoke, gripping my hands to emphasize her point. It will be an adventure that will energize and deepen our relationship. We won't have to do it again if we don't like it. I noticed that she had already made up her mind. The more I contemplated, the stronger my attraction to her became. The way she rubbed against me when we danced, as well as some of what she said, took on new meaning. The idea that such a beautiful woman was interested in me surely energized me. I tried to conceal my growing frustration. Okay, if that is what you desire, so do I. Needless to say, when Don and I met up for supper, the mood was tight. It was instantly evident that both women were dressed to impress, Felicia in red and Mia in black. As they led us to our table in the restaurant, both dresses did more than just hint at the joys that lay beneath. Felicia sat next to Don, and Mia scooted close to me. We were all feeling dizzy, and the waiter must have seen something was up. Despite our efforts to remain inconspicuous, by the conclusion of the evening, I was ready to take things to the next level. However, the women requested to dance first, and Don and I grudgingly obliged. That evening, the orchestra performed largely slow jazz, and the dance served as a musical prelude. Eventually, both females agreed to visit the ladies' room together. Don and I sat at our table to finish our drinks. He reached down, handed me his key, and gently asked, Why don't you and I use our cottage tonight? And Felicia and I will visit your room. We can meet for breakfast tomorrow morning. I nodded, handed him the key, and took a final sip of my mojito. Just at this moment, both females returned, laughing and staring at us with flaming eyes. Mia took my hand and said, I think it's time to go. I looked back to catch Felicia's eye. Corazon, I have fun. I said, she smiled at me, and you, Andy. Mia and I walked to her beachfront cottage. We hugged one another like teens in love, mumbling and laughing at each other's innuendos. But as we got inside, Mia transformed into a tigress. I gazed at her. Her feminine curves and prominent breasts were a welcome contrast to my wife's slim, athletic build. And we had sex. The next thing I knew, Mia was shaking me. Wake up, my love. We'll be late for breakfast. As we got closer to the main building, I clumsily crawled out of bed and started pulling on my wrinkled clothes. She took my arm. You were fantastic last night, Andy. Someday we'll have to do this again. Exactly, Mia, I responded. But the reality was, now that our night of love had come to an end, I was beginning to worry about Felicia and how her night had gone. Sex with me was amazing, but I wanted to know how my wife felt. Felicia and Dawn had already taken their seats as we entered the restaurant. Felicia smiled as she said, Hello, sleepyhead. We were starting to doubt that you'd ever get up. I've even ordered breakfast for you. She leaned over and quickly kissed me. Did things go well for you yesterday? I asked gently. She nodded. Everything was fantastic. How about you? It was good, I told her. Maybe we can discuss this later. Of course. But first you should eat. You appear weary. I smiled awkwardly and began eating breakfast, while eating. We discussed our plans for the day. 
Mia offered to take Felicia and me on a boat. Don was unable to join us because he needed to travel to the little office his company maintained in Crystal River to attend the conference. However, he persuaded us to go without him. Mia is as skilled a sailor as I am. She traveled on the yacht several times without me. He stated that the weather was lovely, so another boat ride sounded appealing. Watching two attractive women in bikinis would also be appealing. So Felicia and I walked into our room to change clothes. However, as we rode up the elevator, I found myself becoming increasingly tired. Felicia giggled as I continued to yawn. I must have tired you out last night, she replied pleasantly, and I had to admit that I hardly slept. Why don't you lie down and take a short nap, Felicia proposed. You seem to be in desperate need of some rest. Mia and I can manage without you. I desperately wanted to go with them, but I couldn't keep my eyes open. I lie down on the bed and close my eyes. Felicia kissed my cheek and went to the door. I'll put up a do not disturb sign, she explained. Sleep soundly, undress. The next thing I heard was a knock on the door and a voice calling out to Salazar. Mr. Salazar, are you here? I attempted to sit up, but the knocking continued. Just one minute, I shouted. I will get up now. What time is it now? I asked myself, and when I looked at the clock on my bedside table, I was surprised to discover that it was nearly 4 p.m. The knocking resumed, pulling my attention again, and I shook my head to clear it. I got to my feet and went unsteadily toward the door. When I opened it, I saw a hotel staffer wearing a troubled expression. We've looked everywhere for you, Mr. Salazar. We called the room, but nobody answered. I must have been soundly asleep. I said, what is the matter? Why are you searching for me? He grabbed my sleeve and practically dragged me towards the elevator. He gasped. There was an accident. You must come immediately. His words sent a rush of adrenaline through me, and I finally started to wake up. Despite my repeated queries, the man told me only that there had been an accident and that I should accompany him. When we reached the main floor, he led me outdoors where a group of uniformed soldiers stood. I discovered him. The employee shouted. I found Mr. Salazar. What happened? I asked in desperation. What's happening? A man in a Coast Guard uniform pointed to the bay. At first, staring into the distance, I couldn't see anything. But then I saw what appeared to be a helicopter circling a weak column of smoke. I do not comprehend. I managed as terror gripped my throat. Another cop picked up the iPad. I didn't know what I was looking at, but it appeared to be a video. This is a helicopter-based live broadcast. The man spoke, and I stared in terror at the image of burning debris floating in the ocean. It appears there was an explosion in flames. What kind of boat was it? I inquired fearfully. He described it as a Chris Craft heavy cruiser. My knees got weak. I swallowed and attempted to properly craft my next inquiry. How about the survivors? Was anybody saved? He stared at me with sadness. The aircraft found no life-saving equipment, and the diver they lowered discovered no bodies in the water. Then, perhaps noticing the expression on my face, he said, but we'll send a boat over from Marine Safety in Tampa right away to conduct a more thorough search and unbidden remembrance of Mako. The shark flashed into my mind. I trembled and attempted to delete the image from my mind. What may have caused this, I inquired, gesturing to the broadcast from the helicopter. It looks like a bomb exploded. The cop shakes his head. We see things like this all too frequently. Something goes awry in the boat's engine area, which fills with smoke. Then when someone attempts to start the engine, an explosion ensues. This is how many boatmen perish. At that point, his radio began to crackle, and he paused to speak. He returned his attention to me after he finished. Our cruiser is currently in a position to continue the hunt. Now there is nothing you can do. Why don't you return to your accommodations and wait for us to contact you if we have any further news? I didn't want to leave, yet I didn't want to stay either. So I turned and went back into the home behind me. Someone whispered quietly, poor people, and my heart dropped even lower. If professionals are this pessimistic, what hope can I have? I waited the rest of the day for a call but never received one. After a while, I began phoning myself first to inform my workplace that I would be leaving on Monday, then to my sister. Finally, I got to the one I was most afraid of, Felicia's parents. It was dreadful. Later, there was a tap on the door. And as I opened it nervously, I saw a waiter carrying a tray of meals. The manager thought you may enjoy a snack, sir. He told me. I offered him a tip and urged him to appreciate the manager's care. 
but despite having not eaten since morning, I felt no hunger. Every few minutes I got up and went out onto the balcony to look out at the bay. Although it was already dark, I hoped to see the lights of a helicopter or a rescue boat approaching us. Unfortunately, nothing happened owing to nervousness and a long sleep. I couldn't sleep, so I began packing our belongings to keep myself busy. As I went down to pick something up off the floor, I discovered a piece of lace beneath the bed. These were Felicia's pants, and when I lifted them, I noticed that the crotch was crusty. Suddenly, the memories of yesterday's sex games resurfaced, leaving me overcome with shame. Instead of being with my wife, I spent her final night with another lady. This, in turn, reminded me of the poor, passionate me. She was probably also dead. If only I had been with them, I could have done something to avoid the accident. Or perhaps you can save them. Then a surge of wrath washed over me. If Mia hadn't tired me out, I would have been there with them and possibly saved Felicia. Then my thoughts moved to Don, and I knew he must be going through the same ordeal as me. I collapsed on the bed and cried. My emotions are continuously shifting, from guilt to grief and wrath to despair. It was the worst night I've ever had. As I lay there, I proceeded to recall the events of my life with Felicia. We both went to Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton and played football. That is how we met. One day after training, she approached me and began discussing strategies. I couldn't take my eyes off of her in her soccer shorts and tank top. She was absolutely stunning. We dated for the final two years of college and married immediately after graduation. Meeting Felicia's family helped me understand her better. Her parents, as I discovered, were staunch anti-communists. My father's family had a sugar plantation in Cuba when Batista was in control. However, landowners lost their plantations after Fidel Castro's revolution took power in 1959, forcing them to cultivate their own fields. In despair, her grandparents left the island on a small boat and arrived in Miami without money. Felicia's mother was born in Miami and raised in great poverty. She and her husband, Felicia's father, both worked low-wage jobs so Felicia could attend college. As a result, Felicia became completely preoccupied with success. During our courtship, she confided in me that witnessing the hardships her grandfather and parents endured led her to vow never to live in poverty again. This reminiscence made me feel even worse about how our lives had turned out. The 2008 housing crisis was especially terrible for Florida, and my booming construction company was suddenly on the verge of bankruptcy. We had to halt all new construction for a while, and we battled to make ends meet with renovation work for a few years. Just to survive, Felicia and I had to sell our house and move into a modest condominium. I felt like a failure, yet Felicia never complained. Her emotional and financial assistance was vital to our survival, and our lives gradually improved. And now I may never be able to fully communicate my love and gratitude to her. We both ignored religion at college. But now, on long nights, I repeat all the Mariahs and Paternosters from my youth, pleading for a miracle. It was all I had left. A faint knock on the door must have startled me awake as I raced to open it, suggesting that I had dozed off approaching daylight. There was another Coast Guard officer standing nearby for a minute. Hope flashed within me, but the solemn expression on his face swiftly extinguished it. I'm very sorry, Mr. Salazar, but the decision has been taken to stop looking for survivors, he replied in an emotionless tone. But you cannot do so, I shouted. It's lighter now, so they'll be easier to find. You must continue looking. He shook his head calmly. Mr. Salazar, our boats have sophisticated radar that searches the surface of the ocean, and our helicopters have infrared scanners that look for heat signatures. We scoured the area all night. If there was something or someone there, we would have found it by now. I must have had a stubborn expression on my face because he continued. Sir, I've investigated numerous boat explosions, but this was one of the worst I've witnessed. It's quite doubtful that either of the two passengers survived the first explosion and flames. When he saw my ashen expression, he reached out and grabbed my shoulder. It's also quite doubtful that any of them suffered. The explosion was powerful enough to destroy the boat. They probably did not feel anything. I wanted to shout. I wanted to get them back to the sea so I could find Felicia. I wanted to die. But instead, I stood there and looked at the floor. Finally, I turned to him. Thank you, officer, for everything you did, I said. 
He shook my hand, turned, and walked solemnly away. I shut the door and collapsed to the floor. I'm not sure how long I lay there, but I started when I heard another knock on the door and opened it. Two men in uniform stood outside. Salazar questioned one of them. When I nodded, he inquired again. What about Andre Salazar? Yes, I answered. It's me. Who are you? He dug into his pocket and brought out his identification. We're with the Citrus County Sheriff's Department. We'd like to speak with you about what happened in the bay yesterday. Okay, I replied obediently. Come inside. That was the last thing I wanted to do right now. But I expected an official police inquiry. We sat down in the living room and the deputy said, Where were you when the accident occurred? The question felt unusual to me, and I didn't like how he stressed the term accident, but I told him I was in the room between breakfast and 4 p.m. It's six o'clock, he said. What have you been doing in your room all this time? I took a snooze, I said, my annoyance increasing. You must have had a great time last night, he replied with a grin. I simply stared at him. Did anyone see you napping? The sheriff's deputy questioned Sadun Ackley. I was able to respond while remaining calm. So far as I know, no. I slept all the time, so no one can authenticate your whereabouts between 10 a.m. and 4.09 p.m. Salazar, he added with a sarcastic drawl. I stood up abruptly. I have heard that condescending tone before. This had not happened for a long time, but he could still touch a nerve. South Florida is predominantly Latino. In fact, approximately 60% of Dade County's population is Hispanic, with nearly half being foreign-born. However, as you move north, this number reduces dramatically, especially in rural areas. It is not unusual to come across some of the same old preconceptions. However, that did not mean I had to accept it. What does all this mean? My wife recently perished in a tragic accident. You're questioning me as if I were a criminal suspect. I said it fiercely. You were the one to use the phrase suspicious, said another officer. That was the final straw. I was very furious. Officers, I understand my rights. And I won't answer any more questions without a lawyer, I stated firmly. Both men gazed at each other. The first person closed the notepad. I'm assuming you know what it's like, Senor Salazar. It sounds like a United States citizen who understands his constitutional rights, I snapped. He shrugged, and they both moved towards the entrance. Okay, then we'll meet you and your lawyer tomorrow at the Citrus County Sheriff's Office in Inverness, he stated before walking out. It took me a few minutes to relax. I then picked up the phone and called my Orlando lawyer, Jose Pasco. When I told his secretary who had called, she immediately linked with me. Andy? he replied, answering the phone. We were all stunned when we learned the news. Please accept my heartfelt condolences on the demise of your lovely wife. The dreadful news did not take long to come. That's why I called Jose. Two racists from the local sheriff's department just questioned me at the Paradiso Resort, treating me like a criminal suspect. I am in an English-speaking country and believe I require the assistance of a lawyer immediately. Look. I'm sure this is all a misunderstanding, but just in case, we need to locate you. Someone who lives nearby or is in court. Let me make a couple phone calls and then call you back. I thanked him and sat down in the chair. I could feel pain throbbing in my head. This nightmare was worsening by the minute. About an hour later, the phone rang and I answered quickly. It was Jose. I have both good and bad news. Let's start with the bad. How well did you know Don and I? Cavendish, he asked me. We just met them this weekend. Mia Cavendish is the former Mia Reynolds. Her father is one of Marion County's richest and most prominent men. He owns the biggest thoroughbred horse farm in Ocala. The gist is that none of the major Central Florida law firms will consider your case. They all rely on Mr. Reynolds, as he informed me. Crap, I exclaimed. So what do I do now? Why? Well, the good news is that I have located a lawyer in Inverness to represent you. Her name is Gina Ellerby. The bad news is that she is quite young and inexperienced, but several others in the region suggested her, he said. I'm confident she'll do an excellent job with your case. Okay, I replied. If you believe she can protect me from the fanatics, then that is enough for me. Okay. He responded, because I have already contacted her office. She'll meet you at the resort in the morning and you two may go to Inverness to meet with the sheriff's department. I'm confident you and she will work things out. He paused, and again. Andy, I'm so sad for your loss. Please let me know if there is anything else I can do to assist. Thank you, Jose.
I responded with difficulty. My emotions were raw. Any reminder seemed to put them in action. A bit later, resort management called to let me know I could stay an extra night if necessary. I thanked them for their generosity. I immediately called my office to ask how things were going. Even in this difficult moment, I realized I couldn't ignore my work. I spent the rest of the day thinking about how to organize Felicia's memorial service. I felt I owed it to her friends, family, and herself. Then I spent another horrible, restless night attempting to figure out what had happened. And the next morning, after breakfast, I was waiting in the room for my new lawyer, hearing a tentative knock on the door. I opened it and discovered a young, fresh woman. Good morning, Mr. Salazar, she said, extending her hand. I am Gina Eller. Be your own lawyer. When she entered the room, I couldn't help but stare at her. Jose informed me that she was young, but this woman appeared to have recently graduated from high school. She was lovely enough, but she reminded me of one of those obese starlets that the Disney Channel seems to produce like clockwork. She turned around and met my gaze. Is everything okay, Mr. Salazar? She asked in a high-pitched tone, like a small girl. Excuse me, I replied. But could you tell me your age? I knew that was impolite of me, but I couldn't stop myself. Her cheeks flushed and she stood up straight. However, that did not help much. Mr. Salazar, I realize I seem younger than my age and have a child's voice. But I am 27 years old. I have successfully completed law school, passed the bar exam, and received admission to practice law in the state of Florida. Now, if that isn't enough for you, I'll leave, and you'll find another lawyer to protect your interests, she replied sharply. I lifted my hands to halt her while also apologizing for my rudeness. Sorry, Miss Ellerby, you have taken me by surprise. Look, we're off to a poor start. Let us try again. My name is Andre Salazar, but my buddies call me Andy. I'd like you to represent me. She took a long breath before extending her hand to shake mine. She claimed she accepted the apology. I would like to call you Andy, and you can call me Gina. I'm looking forward to working with you. So Mr. Pasco has given me a basic overview of your issue, but I'd like to hear more from you. So, I began. Felicia and I came here on Thursday, Andy interrupted. What am I thinking of? I'm so sad for your wife. I intended to say this when I enrolled. I nodded. At that point, all I could say was thank her for her thoughtfulness. I then gave a brief overview of the weekend's activities, except for our brief conversation with Don and Mia on Saturday night. For some reason, I felt that discussing this would be a betrayal of Felicia's memory. When I finished reading, Gina took notes, and it was time to leave. Gina volunteered to drive, and as we drove east, she remarked that she didn't expect any problems. I've previously reviewed the Coast Guard reports, which demonstrate it was a boating accident. I feel our meeting today is simply a standard procedure to conclude this matter. You had the misfortune of coming into a pair of hillbillies. But don't worry, they'll act differently around me. I felt better after Gina became my lawyer. She was plain, and I liked her attitude. We arrived at the Inverness Sheriff's Office. Sheriff McGee himself wanted to speak with us. It quickly became evident that this would not be a routine task. He started by asking the same questions his assistants had asked about my location on the day of the accident. I was uncomfortable confessing that I couldn't confirm that I'd been in the room all day. You say you slept starting around 10 a.m. until around 4 p.m. You must be exhausted from yesterday night, the sheriff observed, lifting his eyebrows. I shuffled uncomfortably in my seat. This was somewhere I wanted to avoid. We danced for a long time in the nightclub. I said, he took a note on his notepad. So how would you describe your relationship with your late wife, Mr. Salazar? He inquired, taking me by surprise. Okay, Sheriff, very good, I replied quickly. We had our problems as any couple does, but we had a wonderful marriage. Gina gave me a stern look, and I sensed she did not appreciate my response. The sheriff nodded attentively. So you were a happy and loyal husband, he inquired, and I promptly nodded in accord. So why, Mr. Salazar? Did the resort workers observe you leave the nightclub with Mia Cavendish rather than your wife? Why did you and she go to her beach home and not leave till the next morning? As I hesitated, I glimpsed Gina's startled response from the corner of my eye. I understood later how strange my attempts to safeguard Felicia's reputation sounded. The only thing I could do now was admit to this massive skirmish. Look, Sheriff, 
Felicia and I were discussing how to spice up our love life a little. And when the opportunity occurred with Don and Mia, we decided to attempt it. I finished and added, I hope you'll be careful. Felicia's parents would be devastated to learn about this, especially now. I am sure you understand. He did not respond, but he did make another note on his notepad. Then he changed gears. Did you and Mrs. Salazar have an insurance policy? He asked. I shake my head. No, we never purchased them. I've always thought it was a horrible investment. So you won't benefit financially if your wife dies unexpectedly? No way, I exclaimed fiercely. Even the accident insurance offered by your wife's employer? He asked. I expressed my confusion. I totally forgot about it. Gina looked at me with terror. I imagine you forgot that your wife recently increased the insurance payment on this policy to one million dollars. The sheriff proceeded. Felicia mentioned something about that, but I had no clue she had increased the rules so considerably. I spoke fast, and before I finished, I realized how unconvincing it sounded. The sheriff moved on to another topic. Let's return to Mia Cavendish for a second. How long have you known each other? I met her for the first time this weekend, I replied quickly. Can you prove it, Mr. Salazar? He returned before I could say anything. Gina interrupted the chat. Come on, Sheriff. You understand that it is impossible to show a negative result. The Sheriff was agitated and evidently annoyed by Gina's meddling. Listen, girl, he began. Gina reddened and got up as she heard these remarks. Gina approached the Sheriff and stood right in front of him. Sheriff McGee, I am a bar member who also serves on the bench. Either you show me the respect I deserve, or I will charge you. As she spoke, the sheriff voluntarily moved away from the enraged young woman. However, she persisted in her approach, pressing his back against the wall. She approached him as closely as she could without touching him, and the pound 250 man appeared terrified by the small woman, who was perhaps half his size. I believe my client has had enough of your obnoxious and ridiculous inquiries for today, she added. So, unless you intend to arrest and prosecute him for a crime, we will leave. If you want to speak with him again, you'll know where to find me. The sheriff looked at me with a wicked grin. No, Mr. Salazar, you are free. You could even return to Orlando. But don't even think about leaving the state of Florida. Gina turned and grabbed my hand, virtually dragging me out of the sheriff's office. When we returned to the roadway, I turned and stared at her. Wow, remind me never to offend you in the same way you treated the sheriff. Listen, she demanded. I'm so close to giving up on your business. Never lie to me again. I cannot successfully represent you if you lie. I apologize, Gina, I said meekly. I did not purposefully lie to you. I felt horrible about switching marriages, and I didn't want to destroy Felicia's or Mia's reputations. And I honestly had no idea Felicia had upgraded her employment insurance to one million dollars. Please believe me. She stared at the road in silence for a while. Okay. She eventually spoke. I believe you, but don't keep anything like that from me anymore. Then she grinned faintly. Moreover, the fact that you and your wife wanted to play does not make you a murderer. I'm still convinced it was a horrific accident. By then, we had arrived at the resort and she had pulled into the parking lot to let me out. I understand that you need to return to Orlando. I'll take care of everything here. And if something changes, I will notify you promptly. After checking out of the hotel and returning to Orlando, my thoughts moved to the dismal days ahead. The first task I faced was a memorial ceremony, which I knew would be tough for me. The phone rang two days ago while I was at work. It was Jose. Have you seen the online news? He asked. I told him no. He answered, well, you should check your local office. But I tell you, you will not like what you see. It appears that someone perpetrated a nasty trick on you. I thanked Jose for the warning and went to check the online publication. When I clicked on local breaking news, the first story I noticed was Orlando man names person of interest in wife death. The narrative not only described the explosion, but it also referenced many of the specifics mentioned by the sheriff during our conversation. The reporter used vague phrases like inexplicable absence, probable motive, and sex games. Damn, I exclaimed indignantly, furious. I called Gina and assaulted her. The sheriff must have leaked all of this information to the newspaper in order to put pressure on me. How could he do such a thing? I sought a response. Furthermore, there are numerous hints and speculations throughout the plot. It reads like something from the National Enquirer. Unlike a respectable newspaper. For that matter, I continued, 
If the sheriff feels the explosion was not accidental, why isn't Don Cavendish a suspect? He could obtain more than I could. Gina told me to forget about Cavendish. He is beyond suspicion. The sheriff informed me that he had a rock-solid alibi and six witnesses. Gina explained that he spent the entire time on a long conference call, and the other folks on the call informed the sheriff that Don was present the entire time. I was not satisfied. This means nothing. Cavendish could be talking on his cell phone. He might be anywhere. Set Gene aside. But he was present, Andy. The building from which he called has CCTV cameras in the corridors. According to the recording, Don entered the building before the call began and remained until the call ended. And before you ask, the building's windows are intact. Gina proceeded after hearing my furious grunt. Andy, I am totally certain that was a horrific accident. I believe the sheriff is poking around because he wants to do a thorough job. Perhaps he's just been watching too many detective shows on television. Regardless, I am confident that we will resolve this case shortly and find you not guilty. Maybe I mumbled, but for the time being, they're accusing me of murdering my wife. There wasn't much more in the headlines for the next four days, but I was terrified to attend the memorial ceremony. Not only will I have to deal with my anguish and loss, but there are also whispers and suspicions. I wanted to hide, but it would only make me appear worse. Aside from that, I reminded myself that I owed it to Felicia. The service was as poor as I had imagined. The priest's sermon provided little consolation, and the anxious lyrics were excruciating when my turn came. I couldn't take it and had to stop mid-sentence. When I tried to discuss some of our happier times together, I choked up and could only utter, I miss you, Felicia, before departing the pulpit. Even though a large number of individuals attended the service, I noticed that fewer people visited the reception area thereafter. Instead, people collected in small groups and conversed quietly among themselves. I could only assume what they were discussing. At some point, I noticed Felicia's relatives standing to the side. Her father gave me a gloomy look, and I wished I could say anything to reassure him that I hadn't hurt his precious daughter. Then her mother approached and quickly hugged me. We know you adored her. Andres. As soon as everything settles down, please come to us. It helped me feel slightly better, but I wondered how long it would be before this was all over. The fact that my entire football squad was present at this event was very memorable for me. Domingo, our striker, finished last in the group. He was little and swift, like summer lightning. He came up and hugged me. Hello, Andre. Hold on, Andre. We all know that you did nothing. He smiled broadly. You are a damn Boy Scout. In all of our games, you've never received a red card. I couldn't help but smile while thanking him. I simply wanted others to believe in me as much as I did. A week after the memorial ceremony, I was working in my office when Gina Ellerby entered. Gina, what are you doing here? I inquired, surprised. I have some information for you. Therefore, I decided to meet with you if you are not too busy. No, not at all. I stated that I was delighted you were here. I just did not want to cause you any difficulty. What did you find out? She informed me that she approached the sheriff and inquired as to how the reporter became aware of the sheriff's probe. I inquired whether he had taken a second job at Sentinel. She stated that he denied any involvement. However, he admitted that he recorded the interview and that others could have heard it. She stated, I thought about the two sheriff's deputies and decided that one of them was the most likely culprit. I disliked it, but there was little I could do. The secret had been revealed and all I could do was pray that my name would be cleared as soon as possible. However, the return of Gina to my office a week later shattered my hopes for a swift vindication. The sheriff informed me that they had discovered additional evidence, and her look indicated that this was not good news. Chris Craft cans have washed ashore. She claimed your fingerprints were everywhere. I shook my head irritably. Of course it is. It means nothing. I informed her that while Don and I were loading the boat to go fishing on Friday, I brought him additional fuel on board. Of course, I'll have fingerprints all over these cans, she nodded. I believe you, Andy. It just doesn't look good. If I were a prosecutor approaching a jury, I would explain that there are three conditions for proving a crime. Motive, means, and opportunities. Felicia's insurance provides a clear motive. Your fingerprints on the jars reveal that you had money. And the fact that you have no alibi for the six hours on the day this occurred raises the possibility. 
but I've already described what happened in all three circumstances. I objected. I understand, she said, and that's probably why they didn't press charges. However, I have seen cases in which juries obtained a verdict based on evidence that was not significantly more reliable than this. I glanced at her, alarmed and despairing. This is becoming a nightmare. What should I do to persuade them that I had nothing to do with this? She considered it for a moment. The weakest link in this instance is the question of where you were on Sunday afternoon. The resort manager informed me that the sheriff's department interviewed all of the personnel to determine whether anyone had seen you during this time. But no one saw you because I was asleep in my room, I shouted. But no one knows this. I'm trapped in proving the negative. Gina began pacing around the room. There must be a way to prove you did not leave the room. She paused before asking. Aren't all the resort's doors opened with a card key? Won't the resort record every time someone enters the room? No, I replied. Card keys do not operate like that. Each door lock is self-contained, designed to respond to a specific code on the card. The code is only valid for this door and for the length of the guest's stay. However, there are no external attachments for the locks. To change the codes on a lock, you must plug a particular gadget inside it. Then I gulped as an idea hit me. But I recently read an article about some new systems that communicate with a central computer, allowing the hotel to keep track of all guests' arrivals and departures. Paradise is an all-new first-class resort. I wonder if he has such a system. It was hope, but that was all I had. So I picked up the phone and contacted the resort. The manager recalled my name, and as I explained my question, he realized why I was so excited. Paradiso is a modern establishment in every way, he explained, including our card system. Why didn't you say something earlier? I sought a response. To be honest, I've never worked in a hotel with such a system before, let alone with the preview and formal launch. We were so busy that I didn't even consider it. However, it appears that the system is working. I will go check it out. He called back a few minutes later. You might be in luck, Mr. Salazar. The system works and we have data on the server from past weekends. Please take care of these notes. They are extremely important to me, I begged him. We'll get to you as soon as we can. Gina and I traveled to Crystal River as quickly as we could. Had the Florida State Police been present, I am confident they would have arrested us. Fortunately, they were all protecting tourists. So we arrived without incident. When we entered the resort, the manager was there waiting for us. He walked us to the computer system and pulled out a stack of printouts he had created for us. Gina and I stared at them, perplexed as to what was going on. Every page reflects a different date. The management informed us here. He continued, pointing at the column. It's time to go. We display room numbers along a horizontal axis. The table's code specifies whether the status is open or closed, as well as whether the card key was used. Gina looked at him, puzzled. How can you open a door without a key? Whether they open from the inside, he explained. He turned a few pages before pointing to a row of lines. Here's a recording of the number Mr. Salazar had during our preliminary weekend. You can see all of the daily arrivals and departures. And here, he said, the next page has the report for that Sunday. As you can see, the door opened without a key. Shortly, 8.30 a.m. It was probably when you and your wife came downstairs for breakfast. I looked at Gina. I did not want her to inform the manager that Don Cavendish was in the room. He said, do you see that? A card key opened the door at 9.57 a.m. About 30 minutes later, the door opened without a key, probably when your wife exited the room. Following this, the door did not open again until 3.56 p.m. I contacted Gina, but it did not help us at all. I could leave the room with Felicia at 10.30, but Gina danced happily. But if you left, how could you go back to the room when the messenger found you there at four o'clock? Don't you understand? You had to stay in the room the entire time. This demonstrates that you were speaking the truth regarding your location on Sunday. My eyes widened as I held her. Gina, you are a genius. Then I turned to the manager. Can you take this? He replied that he had printed them up specifically for us holding a printout in his hand. We rushed to the sheriff's office in Inverness. Sheriff McGee was ready to leave when we pulled into the parking lot. Gina unlocked the car door and raced up, waving the printout in her hand. Sheriff! Sheriff! she exclaimed. We have evidence! He got out of the car and she arranged the papers on the hood. 
She readily described what they were and what they represented. The sheriff examined the printouts with mistrust, but appeared to understand what we were attempting to communicate regarding the resort's key card system. This shows that Andy was in his room the entire time. He could not depart without leaving a notice in the system. Don't you see how this demonstrates that the explosion was simply a bad accident? There's nothing more. The sheriff examined the printout for a few minutes before gathering the documents and placing them in the car. I'll have to look closer at them. I'd also like to chat with the resort manager. He went behind the wheel and switched on the ignition. Then he rolled down the windows. If this turns out to be true, he said it hesitantly. You have done well, girl. Gina was so happy this time that she didn't even notice the sheriff driving away. She turned around and hugged me. I think we did it, she said. I hugged her back. Gina, you are a genius, I repeated. This calls for a holiday. Allow me to invite you to dinner. You are the one who gave the place its name. Gina brought us to McLeod Mansion Bistro, a century-old mansion in Inverness that has been turned into a restaurant. We ate a leisurely dinner on the deck under the canopy, and I used the time to learn more about Glenn. I found out she attended a second-rate legal school in Florida. She did not indicate whether she had received any honors, such as legal review or arguing trial. She admitted that she passed the bar on her second try but was unable to get work at a legal firm. But she didn't give up, as I'd already discovered, so she began practicing on her own. It was a challenge for the first year or so, but someone must have given her a strong recommendation because she began handling all of the legal work involved in developing a new resort west of Crystal River. She embarrassingly confessed that this was her first criminal case. Her personal life was equally unremarkable and charming. She did have a boyfriend, but she hadn't seen him in a long time and didn't want to talk about him. At the same time, it was evident that she didn't make much money. She didn't leave the house often. She didn't have many acquaintances in the neighborhood, so she lived a very secluded lifestyle. As I listened to her, I realized again that she was hardly the most brilliant lawyer I had ever encountered. Furthermore, I believed that her girlish appearance and voice were significant hurdles that made it difficult for potential clients to take her seriously. But she was upbeat, honest, and decisive. That is, she possessed the qualities I respected. More importantly, it appeared that her effort resulted in the discovery of proof that could get me out of Sheriff McGee's crosshairs. And I had to confess that she was quite sweet and humorous, even though she resembled a college freshman rather than a competent lawyer. I liked her, but I also felt sad for her. After dinner, I told her I had to return to Orlando, but she invited me to her home for coffee. This will help you remain awake. On the way back, she said. I relented because I felt obligated to her. When we returned to her house, she gave me a brief tour that concluded in the bedroom. I half expected to find a boy band on her walls. Thankfully, none were present. However, she did have a stuffed animal on her bed. As I started to return to the living room, she grabbed my arm and stopped me. Andy said, I seriously want you to fire me. I was shocked. Why, Gina, I do not comprehend. She smiled shyly at me, because failing to do so would constitute a violation of legal ethics. With these remarks, she drew me closer, stood on tiptoes, and kissed me passionately on the lips. I hadn't dated a woman since I was single. Cavendish and Gina were certainly desirable. However, I forced myself to pause and gently move away from her. Gina, are you certain? How about your boyfriend? And what about? But she pressed her fingers against my mouth to stop me. It's okay, she exclaimed, breathless. I really want this. We made love. The next morning at breakfast, she was noticeably cheerful, humming to herself and even stopping to perform a small dance move for me. I was relieved that she didn't feel guilty about our night. She flashed me a smug smile. So how does it feel to be above suspicion in your wife's death? The expression on my face must have made her realize how it sounded, and she began to apologize. But I stopped her. It's fine, Gina. I get what you mean. But the truth is, I'm still worried. What is this about? It actually happened there. Sheriff McGee seemed certain that there had been a crime, and I wonder if he was right. Andy, don't let this gnaw away at you. It was simply an unfortunate accident, according to the Coast Guard study. Perhaps I replied. However, it is still a fact that Don Cavendish made a substantial profit from his wife's murder. 
and it seems improbable that he could have established such a flawless alibi simultaneously with witnesses who were not present in the same place. Do you realize how paranoid that sounds? Gina asked eagerly. Don's office cameras captured him entering and staying until the conference call ended. That's the end of the blast. Do you know where this office building is? I asked. I would like to go look at it. Gina rolled her eyes but agreed to take me there once we arrived at the address. I observed a plain two-story business building with a handful of office suites for rent. With Gina in tow, I reluctantly strolled around the building. There were only two entrances, one in front and the other in the back. A lengthy passageway joined them. The fixed business windows provided lighting. There seems to be no other way out. We returned to the main entrance and went inside the lobby. At that moment, a security guard emerged from one of the apartments and approached us. How can I help you? He asked. Gina attempted to say something, but I grabbed her hand. My co-worker and I are searching for office space. Is there an open office there we may look into to see if it suits our requirements? We would be extremely appreciative. Of course, he replied. There is no one in 115. Come on, I will allow you in. Gina threw me a stern glare as we followed the guard down the hallway, which I ignored. A kind guard unlocked and held the door for us. Do not be shy. Look around. When you depart, the door automatically closes. He then continued his rounds. The office was unremarkable. Gina asked, what are you looking for? I do not know, she said. I will know when I see it. We passed through a small reception area and entered one of the offices. It featured a floor-to-ceiling window with blinds installed between the panes. I walked over to the glass and leaned in to get a better look. When I saw the logo on the small sticker in the bottom right corner of the window frame, I jumped with joy and turned to Gina. I know this manufacturer. I said, I utilize their windows for one of my projects. So what? She asked. What does it matter? I pointed at her purse. Do you have a nail file? When she handed me the nail file, I went over to the window and pointed out the small hole in the lower left corner. Although the building manager possesses a special key for this task, the manufacturer's representative provided a demonstration using these phrases in the event of the key's loss. I bent down, inserted a nail file into the slot, and twisted it until I heard a click. I rose up, placed my palm on the window's edge, and pulled it open fast one edge turning outside and the other inside the office. Gina gave a gasp. I smiled triumphantly. This is known as a center pivot window. This allows workers to clean both sides of the window without having to walk outside, which is especially beneficial on upper floors. However, it also allows someone on the ground floor to leave the building without going through the hallway. I closed and secured the window before returning the nail file to her. I took her hand. Let's go. We need to try to find the sheriff. Gina cried, wait. I froze. Andy, think about what you are doing. What are you planning to tell the sheriff? That Don Cavendish could physically leave this building undetected? Okay. However, we have no evidence that he did it. And there is no evidence that he went on the boat and caused the explosion. The Coast Guard report depicts a catastrophic disaster as the only possible outcome. Listen, she continued. The sheriff did not arrest you because the circumstantial evidence was insufficient. Of course, he will not arrest a prominent Oakley businessman based on much weaker evidence. She seized my hand. Andy, I understand that you are furious with your wife and angered by the accusations against you, but you will appear even worse if you start talking about murder for no reason. It was an accident. Please let him go. I knew there was a lot of truth in her statements, and my gut told me I wasn't wrong. I looked at Gina. Okay. I'll stay away from Sheriff McGee for now, but I'd like to speak with Cavendish and hear what he has to say. Gina stared at the floor. You cannot do this, Andy, she murmured calmly. Why not? I sought a response. Because he has left town, she said. I attempted to contact him for more information, but his office informed me that he had departed Ocala for an undetermined period. Do you see? I shouted. It indicates that he has something to hide. She stared at me with sadness. Andy, return to Orlando. Take care of the business. Try to begin a new life. You'll be happier if you simply accept that Felicia died in a horrible accident. Then she came up to me and kissed me gently. Please, Andrew. I sincerely care about you. I don't want you to squander your life with conspiracy ideas. 
As I drove back to Orlando, my thoughts raced. Despite Gina's claims, it appeared to me that there were too many coincidences for it to be an accident. Cavendish recently had a meeting that kept him from heading out on the yacht, but colleagues from another city called and could only confirm that they were in touch. Not that he was in his office. There were also some fuel cans. Don just happened to take the cooler full of beer. As a result, I had to carry the cans while leaving my fingerprints on them, and I just kept myself awake all night. So the following day, I was completely exhausted. No, wait, that cannot be true. That would imply that Miller was implicated in her own death. I shook my head wearily. I just couldn't bring all the pieces together. Maybe Gina was correct. Maybe I should simply let it go. The following week, I poured myself into work. I had a lot to do anyway, but I'm also hoping that focusing on my business will take my mind off things. It worked to some extent, but at night, I discovered myself. I'm making diagrams and graphs to try to come up with a plausible scenario. On Thursday, I was just finishing off a job when I heard someone enter my office, glancing up. I was shocked to see Gina standing there in a lovely outfit, holding something behind her back. Gina, I asked, what are you doing here? She extended her hand in front of her to display a bottle of champagne. I'm here to celebrate with you, she added, smiling. The sheriff has officially concluded the inquiry into the explosion. We have officially classified this as a maritime accident. Andy, you're off the hook. I stepped around the table and stood next to her. This is fantastic news, Gina. I sincerely appreciate everything you have done for me. Then he removed the bottle of champagne from her grasp and placed it on the table, taking her hands in mine. I took a thorough look at her. What is happening, Gina? Why are you actually here? Her too happy smile faded, giving way to a more serious expression. I wanted to see you again, Andy. Do not worry, I do not love you. But we have a lot in common. We are lonely, we are both bereaved. She gave me a shy smile and we were both excited. I will leave if you want but I hoped we could support each other, at least for the night. She was correct. I did not intend to fall in love with her, especially so soon after losing Felicia, but I didn't have someone to support me through my loneliness. And if I'm being honest, I was horny. I smiled at her. I've got an idea. Why don't you come over to my apartment and I'll cook dinner for the two of us? Her cheerful face made me smile as I went around my room sipping champagne. I began making dinner. I'm not a particularly terrific cook, but I do make scampi with black beans and rice. I had some peeled shrimp in the refrigerator, which I coated with oil while the grill was heating. Gina assisted me in making a garlic paste for Mojo. I cheated by opening a can of black beans and adding spices, onions, and peppers. They still tasted delicious by the time everything was ready. We were both quite hungry and ate our food rapidly. I purposely avoided discussing the events that brought us together including my doubts regarding Don Cavendish. This would only spark a fight, and I didn't want any issues. Everything appeared to be going well until after supper. I made the mistake of asking Gina how her legal practice was going. Her expression plummeted, and I knew that one of the reasons she had traveled to Orlando was because she had gone missing from the office. She bitterly told me that the work she was doing at the resort had dried up, and she was struggling to make ends meet. I also felt she hadn't heard from her partner and that their relationship, or lack thereof, was taking its toll on her. I couldn't say anything to encourage her, so I held her and tried to be supportive. After a while, she raised her head and kissed me in appreciation. After that, we fell in love again. We both drifted off and awoke early in the morning. She drew me back towards her, and I gladly complied. I may not have been in love with her, but she was a lovely and attractive woman. I couldn't help admiring her. Later, while we were resting in bed, she sat up and grew serious. I had to tell you something, and I stiffened up, anticipating what would come next. She gave it an almost serious look. I believe I know where Don Cavendish is, she said. Where? I asked. Sitting up in bed, my heart rate increased. I went to the resort to check if they had any jobs for me. In the office, I noticed a package in the outgoing mail with Don's name on it. The address was in Lake Tahoe. I wrote it down for you. I attempted to get out of bed, but she grabbed my hand. She mentioned something else, but I don't know what it means. Upon learning that Don's is a significant investor in paradise, I began preparing for the event. I'm not sure what that means either, but I do know I'm heading to Tahoe. I need to get it, to Cavendish and discover what truly occurred. Gina waited. 
I want to go with you. No, I replied forcefully. It is my concern, not yours. Besides, if my assumptions are accurate, this may get dangerous. You need to return to Inverness. I will let you know what I find out. She reluctantly agreed and quickly went. I called my office to let them know I wouldn't be there, and then I started looking into tickets to Lake Tahoe. The best choice was to fly to Reno. The flight left mid-morning. I hurried to the airport to arrive on time. When my plane eventually arrived at Reno Tahoe International Airport, I realized I had made one strategic error. I did not check the weather. An early snowstorm blanketed the entire area. For a person who had spent his whole life in sunny Florida, this was a major issue. However, I resolved not to succumb to intimidation. Many others have adapted to the snow, and I will have to do the same. Fortunately, I was able to rent a 454 at the airport and pay an additional fee for a set of chains. Then I went shopping in Reno. By the time I finished mine, it was late, so I got a cheap motel and ate some takeout. I figured it would be better to go to Lake Tahoe in the morning light. After breakfast, I headed south. I vanished, then headed west onto Nevada, 431. Plows plowed the roads and the traffic melted, most of the leftover snow. So I was moving fairly swiftly. As I approached Galena Creek Park, I pulled over and placed chains on my tires because the snow on the road was getting thicker. The climb up Mount Rose Highway was a nightmare. Heavy snowfall, abrupt curves, and a steady ascent. The tall red stakes along the highway puzzled me until I realized they guided snowplows. My God, I thought, is the snow actually so deep? I finally started making my way down to Lake Tahoe. In some respects, going down the slope was scarier since I knew if I lost traction, I might end up in an icy lake. But I finally arrived safely in South Lake Tahoe early in the day. It took me three hours to drive 40 miles. I was fatigued, so I stopped at Mom Blue, one of the first huge hotel casinos I saw along the route. After settling into my room and sleeping for a while, I leased an SUV and headed to the Cavendish address. Gina had given me the GPS and guided me up the hill till I arrived at a Swiss-style cottage with a stunning view of the lake. My builders. I estimated that this place must be about 10,000 square feet, making it the largest chalet I'd ever seen. But when the snow fell faster and it became darker earlier, I didn't want to risk making a mistake in the dark and getting detected or worse. So I went back to Mount Blow. Once I arrived, I went to my room and ate a burger and beer while watching football on the large screen TV. They broadcast the Miami game, and I was glad to see the Hurricanes attack their opponent. After the game, I decided to check out the casino before returning to my accommodation. Despite the weather, there was a large crowd wandering through the room. I practically gasped when I looked at the blackjack table. Don Cavendish was present, and judging by the size of the stack of chips in front of him, he was doing well for himself. According to the tall, long-haired blonde standing behind him, he was also performing well in this area. She was attractive enough to be a woman of easy virtue. But you never know. Guys with that much money attract attractive ladies in the same way that sugar attracts ants. I didn't want to meet him yet, so I stood behind a gathering of people and observed. He eventually gathered his winnings, and went to the cash register window with his partner. Stick to the plan. I told myself to wait until tomorrow. With these comments, I proceeded upstairs to my room. But falling asleep wasn't simple. In reality, meeting Cavendish triggered a flood of terrible recollections. At the same time, I couldn't stop worrying about what tomorrow would bring. I do not know. I fell asleep, but I knew it was too late. The next morning, after a quick breakfast, I returned to my hotel to prepare for the Reno meeting. I went into a sporting goods store and purchased a combination of skiing and mountaineering gear that the salesman claimed would keep me warm. I decided I'd need it. In addition, I went to a gun exhibition in Reno after learning about it on the internet. There, I purchased a machine gun while carrying one in my pocket. I grabbed my bags and exited the room. I vowed that I would not return to the casino, no matter what. I was in a sad mood as I prepared. Seeing how much snow had fallen overnight made my mood much worse. I cautiously approached Cavendish's nest, thankful for the chains on the tires. I chose to park around the curve in the road so that he wouldn't notice my SUV. I did not see any tire tracks on the road. Assuming Cavendish got home yesterday night, he should still be present. The smoke rising from its chimney increased my confidence that I had timed it well. 
Even though his house was only a hundred yards away, the snow made climbing the slope difficult. I was out of breath when I arrived at his house and hid behind the woods. Despite the attractive appearance of the home security system, my experience in construction allowed me to understand its installation process and how to bypass it without triggering an alarm. It simply took me a few minutes to work with the pry bar and screwdriver that I carried with me. I then took a deep breath. The time has come. The window I pushed open led into an unoccupied guest bedroom. Even better, the carpet on the floor masked my footsteps. I slowly opened the door and gazed out into the long hallway. The light emanated from one end, so I went that way. As I got to the end of the carpeted corridor, I spotted Cavendish sitting at the dining table, looking over some documents. However, when I entered the living room, the floorboard creaked. He lifted his head. He jumped to his feet, but I pointed the gun at him and told him to keep put. When I came close enough for him to notice me, his face broke into a mischievous smile. Well? Well, Andy Salazar, you are the last person I expected to see here. Come on, Cavendish, I growled. I know you blew up the boat, and I understand how you did it. He merely gazed at me, and I persisted, attempting to shatter his confidence. Conference calling was simple. With a mobile phone, you could answer that call from anywhere, and your co-workers would never know. Figuring out how you faked the footage from the office building was more challenging until I went there and noticed the centrally hinged windows. Only a few people realize how simple it is to unlock them once you know the secret. I noticed a gleam in his eye and hoped I had helped him get to the yacht. It must have been a piece of cake. There was likely a motorboat waiting for you. No, he said arrogantly. This was a scooter, even faster and easier to conceal. Because I was wearing a wetsuit, no one recognized me. But why did you do that? You already own a fortune. How much do you need right now? It was his turn to frown fiercely. This is where you're mistaken, Salazar. All the money was in my name. When we married, she insisted on a prenuptial agreement, which she used to keep me in check. I wanted her dead, almost as badly as I wanted her money. His smile returned, and it grew even bigger than before. Of course, I wanted more than just money. At that time, I felt a gun barrel smash against my neck. You'll live a lot longer if you place the pistol on the floor. A whispered voice came from behind me. In despair, I bent down and placed the machine on the floor. The command was to kick him away from Cavendish, and I did just that. At the very least, he will not have it on hand. The bandit backed away from me and continued around the room, eventually ending up close to Cavendish after noticing the long, blonde hair. I cursed my own foolish garbage. I never imagined she would still be here. Cavendish grinned from ear to ear. Andy, you still don't comprehend. He prodded the blonde, and she reached up her head with her other hand to play with her hair, after a minute, she grabbed her golden hair and yanked it entirely off her head, displaying short black hair in a pixie cut. My God, Felicia, I gasped, nearly reeling from the sight. She grinned at Cavendish. See, Don, I told you this was a fantastic disguise. I was shocked. Have you been a part of it all along? I asked incredulously. She stared at me triumphantly. Who do you think should have a double dose of sleeping tablets for breakfast on Sunday morning? Who do you think should have increased my insurance to provide you with an explanation? So, who do you think? Put some more sleeping pills in the cocktail I created for that bitch, Mia, so she doesn't cause us any problems when daylight comes out to the boat. Cavendish was now showing off. It was really straightforward. Mia had already fallen asleep when I arrived at the yacht, making it simple for me to hoist her on board and throw her off. Then I put a bomb in the engine compartment and escaped with Felicia. I dropped her off at the bay where our automobile was waiting for us. Then he returned to Crystal River and sneaked into the building without anyone noticing. The explosion accounted for both the women's absence and the evidence against them. You cleared me of suspicion. I was trying to figure out what they were talking about. I mumbled. However, this suggests a predetermined outcome. Yes, my lovely husband, Felicia interrupted. We fell in love shortly after I started doing public relations for Paradiso. When Don told me about his situation with Mia, we began exploring for solutions. We concluded that an accident at sea was the best way to get rid of her. Let me disappear at the same moment, she added smugly. She added, and the preview was my idea. It worked well to get you to the resort so we could pull it off. I was stunned. 
But why, Felicia? Why did you do it? I thought we were happy together. You loved me so much at the resort. How could you do it? Her face heated, and she spoke with a wild expression in her eyes and an almost frenzied tone. She yelled, you know, why? I previously told you that I would never be impoverished again. I recoiled at her vehemence. I had no idea how badly her childhood had affected her character. Felicia appeared to regain her calm as she stepped over to hug Cavendish. Now that Mia's gone and everyone believes I've passed away, we won't have to worry about money again. I love him. We can stay together forever. No, a voice shouted from the corridor, and I turned to see Gina standing there. She appeared young in the pink jumpsuit, but the revolver in her palm was real. Gina cried. It's not true, she exclaimed to Felicia. Don adores me. He assured me he'd divorce me so we could be together. I looked at her in wonder. Was Don your boyfriend? But her concentration was entirely on Cavendish. You said you loved me. You promised. Cavendish's grin returned. Did I mention that? Gina, I love you. I'm afraid I took some poetic license, but you were with me. You made promises. Gina argued, already sobbing. My darling, you're already aware that men will try anything to seduce a young woman. While I enjoyed our flirtation, I was more interested in your legal abilities or lack thereof. I kept you busy with legal work for Paradiso so you'd be available to represent good old Andy when I ensured no other lawyer would do so. I believed that our son's condemnation in paradise would be based on circumstantial evidence. But you couldn't even do that, correct? You're just a foolish, immature young girl. Gina's pain turned into wrath as she cried, Don't call me a little girl. She most likely accidentally pulled the gun and shot at Dawn. Felicia screamed and shot Gina. Felicia turned and knelt beside Dawn, crying and shaking him. I decided that this was my only chance, and I dashed at her. I rushed up and threw the gun away from her. I raced in to see if I could assist, but there was no pulse in her neck or wrist. Gina, poor thing, such a shame. I was thinking regretfully. I returned to Felicia and stood, looking down at her through her tears. She put out her hand and grabbed my pants leg. Help me, Andy, she implored. Help me, Corazon. I took the pants out of her hands. It's too late, Fuda, I replied with a grin. Then he got out his cell phone and dialed 911. After giving the address to the phone operator, I advised her to dispatch both an ambulance and police officers. There's been a double murder. I replied, assuring her that I would be waiting to welcome them inside the house. Then I sat in front of the window and watched huge flakes of moist snow gently fall upon the lake. The scenery was stunning, but I liked the sand and ocean. I dipped into my other pocket and took out a little recording device that I had purchased in Reno. All I needed to do was click a few buttons to gather everything. I set it on the table to hand it to the cops. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chap does not cheat on you, and then move on to the next narrative because this one pales in comparison to the next one.